7.2.5 Supplementary Section Integration of Powers of Trigonometric Functions. So this is a section that I'm supplementing this textbook with where we're going to discuss integration of powers of all the different trig functions and combinations of those functions. So you've already seen some of these before. If you think, for example, about something simple like sine squared x, uh, we know that we have an identity for that. That is, sine squared of x is 1 minus the cosine of 2x over 2. And from there, we know that we can integrate with simple u substitution. Similarly, we had another identity that allowed us in Calc 1 to integrate cosine squared. And it was that other power reducing identity that said cosine squared was 1 plus cosine of 2x over 2. All right, so the question would be, what happens when I try to integrate other powers of sine or cosine? So for example, what would happen if I tried to integrate an odd power of sine? And you've seen this before, too. I realize that since there's an odd number of sines, I can split off two of them, which leaves that leftover one. And I can convert the sine squared to 1 minus cosine squared x. OK, and that's great because that splits into integral of sine x minus integral of cosine squared x sine x. This one's easy, and I realize the second one will be pretty easy if I do a simple u substitution of u equals cosine x so that du equals minus sine x dx, which means with the correct sign adjustment, this last integral is a u squared du. So the idea again there is if I have an odd number of sines or cosines, I can split one off. The leftover will be an even number of factors. That even number of factors can be converted to the other trig function, that is, sines could be converted to cosines or vice versa through the identity sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. And then the leftover standalone trig function at the end becomes my du. Uh, what would happen if both powers were even? Or what I mean is, what if I was integrating sine to the fourth of x, so an even power of a trig function? And so what I mean by both powers is, well, again, I can split off a sine squared and another sine squared. And I know from there that each of those sine squareds could be converted to 1 minus cosine 2x over 2. And of course, there would be two of them then. I can expand that, and of course when I do, there will be a 1 fourth, and then the tops when distributed will be 1 minus 2 cosine 2x plus cosine squared 2x. And you should notice that this integration is simple, this integration is simple, and then the question, how would I integrate that part, that is, how do I integrate cosine squared 2x? Well, I've changed the argument, but it's still a square of a trig function, which means, again, I would want to use one of these power-reducing formulas. It's just that now this would become integral 1 plus cosine 4x over 2. And from there, a simple substitution will get me to my answer. So you should have actually seen all of this in Calc 1, that is, integrating even and odd powers of sine and cosine. Let's look at what would happen if you put sines and cosines together. Let's say we had sine cubed x times cosine to the fourth of x. That is where I am putting an odd power of one of the trig functions against an even power of the other function.
Well, again, as you look at more and more of these examples, you'll start to get a feel for the, the trick that works in each instance. And the thing I should be keying on here is when I see that one of these has an odd power, it always means that I can split off one of those. There will be an even number left over when I do that. That even number of factors can be converted to another trig function, usually using one of the Pythagorean identities. Again, in this case, since it's sines and cosines, we would be talking about that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 identity. If I split off one of those three sines, then it will leave me with sine squared x, cosine fourth x, with a leftover sine x. I already realized that if u was cosine x, then this part would be u to the fourth. And then if I put a negative in front of that, that would be my du. Okay, the problem is I need this converted to cosines as well. But again, since that's an even number of sines, I know that I can convert sine squared to 1 minus cosine squared. And like we said, uh, we know that if we put a minus in front of that sine x, that would make a du if our u was cosine x. And of course, that's precisely what we've got when we distribute. We have cosine fourth x minus cosine sixth x times negative sine x dx. Using this substitution, it looks like we've got u to the fourth minus u to the sixth du which is an easy integration. Okay, that's what it would look like if I put an odd power against an even power. Now, in this video, we're not going to go through <coughs> excuse me, every conceivable combination of even and odd powers. There's just too many parity combinations to check there, but we'll go through enough so that you get the general pattern. If we finish out the sine and cosine possibilities, uh, we just did odd and even. What if we had odd and odd? That is, what if we had sine cubed of x times cosine fifth x? Well, it's actually the same as the last case. I can split off one of those odd number of factors for either sine or cosine. When I do, there'll be an even leftover. Okay, which one should I split? Well, think it through. If I were to split off a cosine, like so, then of course we're thinking this will be the du for sine, which means I'm thinking ahead to making u sine x. Okay, but if I do that, it means I'm going to have to convert that cosine to the fourth to sines. Okay, notice to do that, I'm going to have to write cosine fourth as 1 minus sine squared squared. Nothing wrong with that, but my alternative is to split one of the sines off from the sine cubed, which would give me sine squared times cosine fourth times a sine. And now I realize that this is my perspective du, and it looks like my u would be the cosine fourth, or cosine rather, which means I would just need to convert that sine squared to cosine. And you notice that's a little bit easier. That is, I can write this integral as 1 minus cosine squared times cosine fourth. And basically that's the integral we were looking at on the previous page. Okay, so rule of thumb, uh, if I'm splitting off an odd factor of either an odd power of sine or an odd power of cosine, uh, it might make sense to take away from the one that has the smaller power. That just tends to make things a little bit shorter. Uh, what about the one other combination, which would be both even? So suppose I had the integral of sine fourth times cosine sixth. 
Well, there are a couple ways to do this, but the traditional way is again to use the power reducing formulas to put everything in terms of cosines of double angles. So what I mean by that is I can certainly look at that sine to the fourth as sine squared squared, and I can look at that cosine sixth as cosine squared cubed, and I can certainly convert that sine squared to 1 minus cosine 2x over 2, and I can convert that cosine squared inside the cube to 1 plus cosine 2x over 2 cubed. Okay, now, of course, when I multiply that all out, I am going to end up with a actually an 8, a 32 in the bottom, and a 1 minus cosine 2x squared times a 1 plus cosine 2x cubed. Now I won't finish this one all the way out, but I'll just say that in the next step you know you're going to have to FOIL or distribute everything out. When you do, you're going to end up with a 1 minus a 2 cosine 2x plus a cosine squared 2x plus a 1 plus a 3 cosine 2x plus a 3 cosine squared 2x plus a cosine cubed 2x. And I'll just notice now, uh, if I think about the different terms there, that one's no problem, this one's no problem. How would I integrate this one? I would have to do another reduction using my formula from before, that cosine squared is 1 plus cosine 2x over 2. Notice when I do that, that this term becomes 1 minus, or rather 1 plus, cosine 4x over 2. Okay, continuing on, of course that's another constant term. That's another easy integration. Actually, you do notice there are like terms here all over the place. Okay, what does that get us down to here at the end? Well, we have a square function again. Well, that's like the one we just did here. Those are like terms. So that leaves just this one at the end, which is that cosine cubed 2x. Well, on the previous page, we talked about how to integrate an odd power of cosine. So ultimately, some of these different combinations will lead you to other combinations that you have simple methods of solution for. All right, so that kind of takes us through all the sine and cosine combinations. So let's think about some of the other trig functions now. For example, let's move to the next of the three basic trig functions. Look, look, let's look at tangent raised to various powers. And there's really, of course, just the two cases. How do I integrate an even power? How do I integrate an odd power? Well, of course, the, the simpler one, I guess it depends on your point of view, but this one over here, if we think about our approach on some of the previous combinations with sine and cosine, again, since I see that odd power of tangent, it suggests that possibly I might think about splitting off that single tangent. Uh, when I do, I do get something useful. I get tan squared, and again we said that many of these different combinations we're talking about will eventually lead you to a point where you can exploit one of the Pythagorean identities. By the Pythagorean identities, I mean of course sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, but I'm also talking about 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared, and 1 plus cotan squared equals cosecant squared. And of course this second one here allows me to write tan squared as secant squared minus 1. And that's the one I want. Alright, so it looks like tan cubed can be written as tan squared, which is secant squared minus 1, times tangent. Okay, notice what that is. If I distribute, it's tan x secant squared x minus integral tan x. 
Okay, you shouldn't have any trouble with that one. That's a UDU situation. And this is one of the basic integrals we learned in Chapter 6. Recall that the integral of tangent is the same as the integral of sine over cosine. And if u is cosine, du is negative sine, which means if we add a negative, then this precisely becomes 1 over u du, which is negative ln u, absolute value. So our antiderivative for tangent is negative ln of u, which is cosine x. And of course, that's how I would handle that part. OK, what about the other case where we're taking the integral of an even power of tangent? Well, let's do the same thing we just did over here. We have that tan squared sitting there all by itself. If I just immediately applied the Pythagorean identity and converted that tan squared to a secant squared minus 1, I get the integral of secant squared minus the integral of 1. And of course, I know this is just tangent, and I know this is just x. What would happen, for example, if the power was a little bit larger, but still even? I would still split off that tangent squared, which means the leftover would be even this time. I would still want to convert at least one of those tangent squareds to a secant squared. OK, what does that leave me? If I distribute, I have tan squared x secant squared x minus integral tan squared x. Well, again, when I look at this first integral, I recognize that as a u squared du form. Oops, forgot my dx. Uh, what about integral of tan squared? Well, that's the one we just did up here. So it's a bit recursive there. You're going to end up evaluating an integral of tan squared if this power you start with is even. You will eventually chew it down to one of those at the end. All right, so I'll just point out without doing any examples here that integrals of powers of cotangent would follow similar patterns simply because the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And we have that similar Pythagorean identity that says 1 plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. So the pattern on integrating powers of cotangent, uh, the patterns would be exactly the same as the patterns for integrating powers of tangent. All right, so let's summarize what we've got so far. We've got methods for integrating powers of sine, powers of cosine, powers of tangent, powers of cotangent, powers of or combinations of powers of sine and cosine. So if we're still trying to round out the list of basic forms, uh, the next thing would be integrals of powers of, let's say, secant. And I'll just say, once we figure out how to do that, uh, the patterns for cosecant is similar, are similar. So what we're talking about is, how do I integrate powers of secant? And let's say we did something like secant fourth, just to see what it looks like when we're talking about integrating an even power. Well. Again, you're, you're starting to get the experience now, and you have these cues that you keep seeing. If I see an even power of secant, uh, my first thought is to split off an even power of secant. OK, and I know that there's two reasons that might be useful. Number one is that secant squared is the derivative of tangent. And I know any even power of secant can be converted to tangents via that identity 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared. So in this case, I can convert that secant squared to 1 plus tan squared, 
and that's perfect because I realize that that secant squared will be the derivative of tangent, which means we're looking at integral secant squared plus integral tan squared secant squared. Okay, again, I recognize that the second integral is a u squared du form. Okay, what's the first one? Well, that's simple. Integral of secant squared is just tangent. And again, just to remind you uh, what would happen if that power was greater. For example, if I had something like secant 8, well, again, if I split off a secant squared, I know that secant squared can be a derivative for tangent. When I split off the secant squared, since this power is even, the leftover part is also even. If that leftover part is even, then I know that can be converted to tangents. Specifically, I know secant 6x is secant squared, which is 1 plus tan squared, cubed. And then of course when I integrate that I'm going to distribute out the 1 plus tan squared cubed. I'm going to get 1 plus 3 tan squared x plus 3 tan fourth x plus tan 6x. And now you should recognize that this really looks like, well first of all, this one, when I distribute, is just going to be integral of secant squared, which is tangent. But then you should recognize that when I put this one against the secant, that that's a u squared du form. This is a u to the fourth du form. This is a u to the sixth du form. All right, so that means the other question is, what happens when I try to integrate an odd power of secant? So what happens when we look at something like secant cubed? Okay, this is the first one that uh, presents a little difficulty. So what have we been saying? If we have secant cubed, so at least two of them, we can certainly split off a secant squared. That leaves a secant. Okay, immediately what's the problem? I know that secant squared could be a derivative for a tangent, but since I only have an odd number of secant factors here, I realize that that secant cannot be readily converted to tangents because it doesn't have, or that leftover is not an even number of secant factors. So the things we've been doing in the earlier examples don't quite work. Um, we could try integration by parts, and the two parts could be secant and secant squared. Because at this point, that's really the only other technique we've got that looks like it might be applicable here. All right, so the question is, if I was going to do integration by parts, which part would be which? I need to pick a u, I need to pick a v prime. Just remember, the v prime needs to be something that I can integrate. And it would be nice if when I integrated it, it integrated to something simpler than v prime already is. Similarly for u, I know I'm going to end up taking u prime, and I would like u prime to be simpler than u, if possible. So notice it is possible to integrate both of these. We know the antiderivative of secant squared. We know that's tangent. Uh, we know the integral of secant. We derived that in the last chapter. All right, one thing is clear just from uh, you know, cursory inspection. I probably don't want to let v prime be secant because look, like, look at what the antiderivative looks like. That means when I go to do the integration by parts and I write the first part, which is uv, the v that I see right here in the formula would be this ln secant plus tangent that doesn't seem like it's probably going to be better. All right, now if I think about the other way to go, which would be letting 
v prime equals secant squared. Uh, that makes sense because the antiderivative secant squared is really simple. It's just tangent. Okay, what's u? Well, I'd have to pick u to be secant, which means du would be secant tangent. All right, so let's put that together. And let's recall that our integration by parts formula says if I'm integrating uv prime, my formula gives me uv minus v u prime, which means in this case I would have uv, so uv, which would simply be secant x tangent x, minus integral v, which is tan x, tan x u prime, which is secant x tangent x, which means, of course, what I really have there is tan squared times secant. So let me change that to tan squared secant. So now I have integral of secant cubed x is equal to this expression on the right. All right, so when I look at this last integral, I immediately see the Q that there's a tangent squared there, which I know could be converted to secant squared minus 1. If I did that, the right side of this equation would be secant x tangent x minus integral of secant squared x minus 1 times secant. And when I distribute, that would give me secant cubed x minus secant. Okay, so what do I see on the right side? I see, I see secant x tangent x minus the integral of secant cubed x plus the integral of secant. And of course, if you are thinking back, something should be uh, ringing a bell here. Obviously, that's done. I know how to integrate secant. Here on the right side is that same integral I started with, but it's negative. Whereas the term over here that we started with on the left is positive. So this is that old trick where I apply integration by parts. I end up with the same integral I began with, with some coefficient in front of it other than 1, which means if I add secant cubed x integral to both sides, then of course I'm going to get 2 integral secant cubed x equals secant x tangent x plus the integral of secant x, which we said was ln absolute value secant x plus tangent x. And I realize now that I could simply divide both sides by 2 and have my answer for integral of secant cubed. So the upshot here is the answer to the question, how do I handle the integral of secant mx when m is odd? is that I need to do integration by parts. And I'll just tell you when m is 3, which is the uh, first odd power that makes sense for us to look at, we had to do integration by parts once. If you end up having to do m equals 5, you would have to do it twice m equals 7 would involve doing it three times. And in your homework, you're going to have to do integration by parts for a secant, odd power of secant, at least as big as 5, at least once. And when you get to that first problem and you do your second integration by parts, you'll see something interesting happen. Um, not much of a hint, but I'll just say the integral of secant 5 will have something to do with the integral of secant cubed.
So take that as a hint and be on the lookout for that when you try that the first time. Okay, what about integrals of powers of cosecant? I will just say C methods for integral of powers of secant. So much in the same way that I said the same patterns would apply to integrals of cotangents that would apply to integrals of tangents, the same goes for integrals of powers of secant and cosecant. All the same little tricks we just pulled out for even and odd powers of secant would apply for even and odd powers of cosecant. All right, now what does that give us? We're building the list. We've got sines, cosines, tangents, cotangents, secants, cosecants. We've looked at how to build patterns for combinations of powers of sine and cosine. So now the only question that's left is, let's say, combinations of other functions. In particular, we're talking about secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. All right, so let's look at a few examples of that to see what happened. And it does turn out that even though there are many, many different combinations you can build out of all six trig functions, they do sort of reduce to a, a limited set of cases. So the first thing I want to look at is combinations of tangent and secant. Let's look at those first. So we'll look at three examples. Let's look at the integral of tan fifth x secant fourth x, which of course is an odd and an even, but specifically it's an odd on the tangent and an even power on the secant. Okay, let's think back to all of the approaches we've taken so far. There are two things you should be thinking about. One is there are an even number of secants, which means I could certainly split off a secant squared, and I know that secant squared could be a derivative for tangent. There's one way I could go. The other thing that you should be spotting is that there is an odd number of tangents, which means if I split off one of those, and I had tan fourth times tangent, I know that this part would be expressible in terms of secants. Now the only problem here is that, well, if I express that in terms of secants, and you have the secant fourth there, I would still have that tangent left over. And then what do you do with it? There isn't really any place to put it. This first approach seems to make sense though because Again, that secant squared could be a derivative of tangent. And what's left over here out of this secant fourth? It's another secant squared, and I know that can be converted to 1 plus tan squared. So putting all that together, we're saying that among the two things I could try, the one that seems to make sense with what I've got to work with is to split off a secant squared. And I already see this would be like a u to the fifth, and that would be like a du. But of course, I know this part is also tangents. It's 1 plus tan squared. So what I really have is tan fifth times 1 plus tan squared, secant squared, which means I have tan fifth plus tan seventh. And then what I have there is u to the fifth plus u to the seventh du, which means what I end up with is tan sixth over six plus tan seventh over seven, and that's my antiderivative. Okay, so that's an odd and even combination where the even is on the secant, the odds on the tangent. I'm saying it that way because it might be a little different if I switch those around. So let's look at the other even-odd combination. 
which would be putting an even on the tangent and an odd on the secant, let's say secant cubed. Okay, again, what sorts of things can I think about doing here? Well, I can certainly write that tangent forth completely in terms of secants right now. If I have an even power on tangent, I know through that identity 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared, all of that could be converted to secants. So that might be the way to go. Let's see what that would do. Tangent fourth would be secant squared minus 1 squared times secant cubed. Okay, what would that give me? It would give me secant fourth x minus 2 secant squared x plus 1 times secant cubed. And when I distribute, I get secant seventh x minus 2 secant fifth x plus secant cubed x. And we already know how to do the integral of secant cubed x. That's that integration by parts example we just looked at. And what I told you is that to integrate any other odd power of secant, we would have to do multiple integration by parts. 2 for this one, and 3 for this one. And so I'm going to leave this one undone, because you're going to have a problem like this in your homework. And the thing, only thing you need to figure out is, what does it look like when I do that second integration by parts to get this one, or the third integration by parts to get this one? All right, so obviously converting the, the even power of tangents to secants worked. Is there any other way to go? Uh, the other thing you might be thinking is that I could split off a secant, or what I'm really saying is splitting off a secant squared, because you're thinking maybe that secant squared could be a derivative for tangent. But again, uh, like the problem we saw on the last page, I have this leftover factor of secant. It can't be converted to tangents, because I don't have an even number of them, so I'm kind of stuck with that. I certainly don't want to convert the tangent fourth to secants, because then I blow the fact that the derivative of tangent is secant. Actually, what happens when I do that is I get back to this one. So trying the two things that sort of make sense based on the examples we've seen so far, uh, the only one that's really going to get us anywhere is this one, which leads unavoidably to this integration by parts technique. Okay, what happens if they're both even? I'm sorry, both, uh, both odd. Let's do that one first. Tan fifth x, let's say uh, secant seventh x. So some big powers there. Well, again, uh, what could I do? I understand that if I could split off a tangent from the tan 5, I'd have an even number of tangents. Those could be converted to secants. If I split off one of the seven secants, that would leave me secant 6. That part could be converted to tangents. The only problem is if I do that, I'm not going to have enough material for either the derivative of tangent or the derivative of secant. So what I mean by that is if I write this as tan fourth tangent and I convert this part to secants and then I put it with the secant seventh, um, what I need for the derivative of secant is secant times tangent. And all I'd have left is a tangent. Okay, what if I instead tried to write this as tan 5 times secant 6 times secant? Well, what I'm thinking there, of course, is changing this to tangents, some power of tangent. When I put those together, I'll have a power of tangent, but what do I need for a du, a secant squared? All I have is one secant. All right, so splitting off the odd leftover tangent or the odd leftover secant is not going to get me where I want to go. Uh, 
Now, there is another possibility you might already be considering. What if I split off both? Since they're both odd, what would happen if I split off one of the tangents and one of the secants? Well, the first thing you should be noticing is that when I put a secant and a tangent together, that's the derivative of something. And you should recall that that's the derivative of secant. Meaning, secant x tangent x could be my du if my u was secant. Well, I've already got a bunch of secants right here. And since this is an even power of tangents, I know this could also be converted to secants. Again, using my identity, uh, 1 plus tan squared, or rather, tan squared equals secant squared minus 1. So that's the way we're going to go. We're going to convert that tan fourth to secant squared x minus 1 squared times secant x, secant sixth x, times tangent secant, or secant tangent. And now if I let u equal secant x, I know du is secant x tangent x. And of course, what I have right here in this integrand, in this part, oops, too far, in this part, if expanded, is just a bunch of terms that are powers of secants. So in particular, I have secant fourth x minus 2 secant squared x plus 1 times secant sixth times secant x tangent x dx, which of course means if I make my substitution, I have u to the 10th minus 2u to the 8th plus u to the 6th du. And from there, it's easy power rule application. Okay, now, what's the only one we didn't cover here yet? It's the one I started to, to say a minute ago. It's what if both powers are even? So what if I had a tan fourth and, let's say, a secant fourth? Well, you should see that of, of the four that we've talked about here, including this one, uh, now that we've looked at the other three cases, this one should jump right out at you. I realize that since there's an even number of tangents and secants, I could split off two secants or two tangents. And of course, the real simple one is if I split off two of those secants, again, I know this becomes a du if u is tangent. And again, since this part that's left over is an even power of secant, I realize that can be written in terms of tangent. Secant squared is equal to 1 plus tan squared. Okay, so what does that give me? Again, expanding, I get tan fourth, and I get tan sixth. And I have precisely a u to the fourth plus u to the sixth du pattern there. All right, so we have just talked through all four of the different distinct combinations for a power of tangent multiplied by a power of secant. Uh, I'll just make the uh, glib note here at the bottom that uh, for integrals of the form cotangent to a power, cosecant to the power of a different power, let's say m and n, uh, I'll just say same, as in the patterns match all of the approaches that we just came up with for tangent and secant combos. Okay, now, just to summarize where we're at, we can definitely handle integrations of powers of sine and cosine and tangent and secant and cosecant and cotangent, we can handle powers of sine 
multiplied by powers of cosine. Now we've talked about how to handle a power of tangent times a power of secant. And I'm telling you that the power of, or a power of cotangent times a power of cosecant, those will follow similar patterns that we saw with tangent and secant. So the question is, what's left? Well, there, there are still a lot of possible combinations you can build. And so let's just look at four examples to kind of see what can happen. And we can't really talk about, or we're not going to talk about every single combination. But let's just talk about a few just so that you can see the general pattern and, and generally how you would look at these or, or try to take them apart. So let's look at something like uh, sine fifth x times cosecant seventh x. Okay, now, you know, it's one of the other combinations I could do, but if you think about what uh, the relationship between sine and cosecant is, you should right away see that this is a super simple integral. If I just think about what cosecant is and rewrite it in a way that relates it to sine, well, of course, I know cosecant is just the reciprocal of sine. And so, of course, what I've got here really is the integral of 1 over sine squared. But, of course, what's 1 over sine? That's just cosecant. So this is really just the integral of cosecant squared. And that's a simple, basic integration that gets me minus cotangent. So what I'm suggesting with this example is that when you see a pairing of something like a sine function and a cosecant function, um, if there's a reciprocal relationship, which there is between sine and cosecant, or cosine and secant, or tangent and cotangent, for example, then when I put these things together, there's going to be a bunch of cancellations, and I'm going to be able to reduce it to a fraction that contains a power of just one trig function. If that power is already in the top, great. If it's in the bottom, like it was in this, in this example, then just move it back up to the top, which gives you the reciprocal function. And we already know how to integrate powers of all six trig functions. So what we're talking about in this example is putting a power of a trig function against a power of its reciprocal function. And those integrations turn out to be pretty, pretty nice, pretty easy. Another example, okay, what if I put cosine cubed against cosecant fifth? Okay, notice this time I'm not putting cosine against its reciprocal. Cosecant's the reciprocal of sine, not cosine. Well, again, though, I should at least try to rewrite this in a way where I can see more clearly what's actually there. So, since we're used to thinking in terms of sines and cosines and tangents so much, it'll be really plain if I move that cosecant fifth to the bottom and make it sine fifth. Now, what you should extract from that, the thing that uh, should be jumping out at you, and if it's not, then just bear this example in mind, I should know that any time I see cosine over sine, that that becomes a cotangent. And I definitely see that there are three cosines to go with three sines in the bottom. And what's left, of course, is two sines in the bottom. And of course, I know that cosine cubed over sine cubed is just cotangent cubed. What's one over sine squared? It's cosecant squared. Okay, this is just one of those combinations we just mentioned. Actually, it's the cotangent cosecant combination that I said uh, you would handle in a way similar to how you handled the tangent secant combinations. Okay, how would I do this one? Well, I know negative cosecant squared is the derivative of cotangent. So, of course, if u is cotangent, then du is minus cosecant squared x dx. 
which means this integral becomes minus integral u cubed du. And right there is my du. All right, so here I'm putting a trig function uh, not against its reciprocal, but against the reciprocal of the other complementary function. In this case, cosine against the reciprocal of sine. So perhaps they don't go together the way these two do so naturally, but when I put them together, what happens is I end up reverting to one of the cases we've talked about on previous pages. Okay, so let's look at another example. And let's see, what haven't we done? We haven't done something like a power of sine against a power of tangent. Now if it was tangent secant, of course we know how to handle that. Um, I will point out to you that if it was tangent times cosine, that is if it was a power of tangent times a power of cosine, that would be a pretty nice one because I know tangent is just sine over cosine. And in that case, I would get some immediate cancellations of cosines. Okay, in this case, I've chosen a product that puts sines against tangents, where tangents are made out of sines over cosines. In other words, this one is going to be top-heavy with sines. In particular, we're saying this would be sine cubed x times sine fourth x over cosine fourth x. And so you see what I mean there by top heavy with signs. There are seven of those in the top. So let's see, if we write it that way, we have sine seventh x over cosine fourth x. All right, now, the first thing you, if you're going through the list of tricks and techniques you know, uh, you're running through possibilities. And when I see this odd power on the sine, what I should be thinking of, or what should come to me, is that if I split one of those off, that sine would be the derivative of cosine, which means there might be some sort of 1 over u to the fourth du thing happening there. Now, the other thing to worry about is what happens when I split that sine off. There's some signs left over. Okay, what's great about this one is that when you split off that extra sign, how many signs are left over? It's an even number. Now, I don't really want to convert any of this back to tangents because that will just take me back to where I started. But what I can do is exchange these sines for cosines. So what I mean by that is I could rewrite this as 1 minus cosine squared x cubed. That would give me sine 6x over cosine 4x times sine x. Okay, why am I doing that? Because I realize if I can exchange those sines on top for cosines, then this entire function right here ends up being function of cosines, various powers of cosines. In particular, we have 1 minus 3 cosine squared x uh, plus 3 cosine fourth x minus cosine sixth x all over cosine fourth x. And if I do a little cleanup there, which will be easy to do since there's just one term in the bottom. What I have there is cosine, let's call it cosine of x negative 4, as in cosine of x to the negative fourth, minus 3 cosine negative 2x. And then what do I get out of this one? Actually, just a plus 3. 
and then this last one gives me a minus cosine squared x. Now, of course, I realize that sine is the derivative of cosine, which means if I put a minus right there, then what I end up with is a minus integral u to the minus 4 minus 3 u to the minus 2 plus 3 minus u squared du. And that's, again, simple power rule application at that point. So this one's a little more exotic, uh, perhaps not as intuitive as some of the ones we just looked at. But uh, even this unusual combination, if I, if I use simple intuition and take my experience, which tells me anytime I see a tangent put against a sine, I might want to rewrite that tangent as sine over cosine, see what happens when I put all those sines and cosines together. Well, here I have a rational function of sines and cosines, powers of sines over powers of cosines. In this case, I actually had enough in the top and the correct parity, it was odd, to pull one off. And once I did that, I knew I could finish this because I knew that could be the derivative for any combination build up completely of cosines, which is exactly what's left there because that power in the top on the signs was even. Now, of course, what if that power had not been even? That's a different combination, and there's still lots of different combinations we could talk about. We could fill two or three more hours here with all the different combinations. We're not trying to build up a comprehensive toolbox of approaches for all these different combinations, just a basic set that you could apply to figure out any of these uh, given enough ingenuity and knowledge of those techniques. All right, so let's look at one last example. So let's see, we just did tangent against sine. Uh, there's another combination that might strike you as a little odd. We know how to put cotangents against cosecants. That's like a, a basic canonical combination we just talked about on a previous page. And putting cotangent with sine or cosine would work out. That's similar to the last example we just talked about. But what would happen if I put cotangent against the other reciprocal function that it doesn't naturally pair with? That is, instead of putting cotangent against cosecant, what if I put cotangent against secant? So let's say I have cotan fourth times secant seventh. Well, again, I do what comes naturally. I convert that cotangent to cosine fourth over sine fourth. I convert that secant seventh to something a little more intuitive, like one over cosine seven. And sure enough, I actually do get some simplification here. I get those four cosines to cancel out with four of those cosines in the bottom. So what I end up with is integral one over sine fourth x cosine cubed x. Okay, now we haven't seen this combination before. We know how to integrate a combination of a power of sine times a power of cosine. But now I've flipped that where the two of those are in the denominator. And that is definitely not something we've looked at yet. All right, I'll just tell you that uh, this, this last one is an example to show you that there are limitations to what we can do. So if you try to apply all the different techniques and strategies we've just talked about in these previous examples, you're not going to get anywhere with this problem. Okay, there is a technique for doing this one, and we'll talk about it in a later section in this chapter. And that general technique we talk about there will more or less handle all of the other weird combinations that can't be handled by the basic approaches we've talked about in this section. So uh, we'll just say this is going to be covered by a special substitution
and we'll do that in a later section. And so when we get there, uh, maybe we'll remember to come back and look at this one and see how to handle this type. Okay, good place to stop. Let me know if you have any questions.